If I had a thousand tongues to sing your glories one by one, it would be a ceaseless song. There is a depth of riches here that saints have mined throughout the years. Oh my Lord, how wonderful you are. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this morning's worship here at the Rock Church in Squamish. And we're going to get started here with our first song. So won't you, just where you're at, stand with us as we worship Jesus. Our Father everlasting, 
the all-creating one God Almighty through your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus and I believe in you I believe you rose again I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in life eternal. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus oh I believe in the name of Jesus gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love the Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love and the Lord is good to all and he has compassion and all that he has made as 
far as the east is from the west, that's our Father. He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's our Father. He has removed our transgressions from us. Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And the Lord is good to all, and He has compassion on all that He has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's our Father. He has removed the transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's our Father. He has removed the transgressions from us. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Praise the Lord. So praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love the Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love yes, Lord thank you that we can just sing that out this morning Lord that we can come and just declare that truth that you are gracious that you are compassionate and Lord we thank you for that we thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth and uh, that's what we want to do with all of our hearts and Lord with all of our strength and, and with all of our minds so uh, Lord be blessed today uh, we pray your blessing over this morning's message by Glenn. And uh, yeah, we ask Holy Spirit, come and empower him. 
and come and illuminate to us, Lord, your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. <laughs> that was a very quick wardrobe change. Just, just checking, see if you're paying attention. Good morning. My name is Glenn, one of the uh, pastors here at the Rock Church. Great to be with you. Great to have you visiting with us here on Facebook Live on Sunday mornings, wherever you are from, whether it's Squamish, Sea to Sky, across British Columbia, even a few of you from across Canada. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you have a Bible with you, you'll need to open it. It'll be good to have a Bible open in Luke chapter 18. We're going to be moving on to, into verses 9 to 14, another amazing parable, one after another. Uh, that Jesus teaches to his disciples and all those who will listen. Uh, in in uh, the beginning, to, just to preface that, I just got to say to you, you and those of you who know me, I think you know, um, I have a, a bit of an enthusiasm for the Word of God. I get excited about the Word of God. I get excited about preaching it, about studying it, about talking about it. And uh, it seems that every week lately, it's just I'm getting more and more excited, and that is true today too because... I saw something in this past week. Just when you go through books of the Bible, verse by verse by verse, over time, uh, sometimes what happens is, and this is the reason why we do it, is pennies start to drop. Th things start to get lined up in such a way that you start to go, aha, oh, that's what Jesus was getting at about the kingdom and about salvation, about the gospel. That's where we're at, I think, in a major way today, and I, I really hope you'll see a, a penny drop. And it's a result of, you know, Luke's reason for writing this gospel. We read about it in the very first verses, right? You all know this. I've said it a few times. He was writing a orderly account, right? He wanted to interview all of the apostles, those who followed Jesus, even his mother Mary, because Luke wasn't around at the time when Jesus was, was doing his ministry. And he wanted to write an orderly account, set an account together so that his good friend Theophilus could have certainty about Jesus. And I got to believe, and we've talked about this, that that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants for you and for me as well. But one of the things we know about his gospel is they're not necessarily ordered chronologically. That's not what he meant. They're ordered thematically often. And that's exactly what I think we're seeing here today from last week's parable to this. And so that's what I'm hoping you will see, that the big idea will be a real penny drop for you today. That's my hope and prayer. So I'm going to read our verses for today, verses 9 to 14 in Luke 18. Please read along with me, then I will pray one more time, and then we will have a look at this great parable. He, Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed. He prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes, his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified, justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Pray with me, would you? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity uh, to study the words of Jesus, to hear them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would uh, bring these alive in our hearts today. I pray that you would set aside my thoughts, my words, me. Lord, would you, would you speak through this? Holy Spirit, would you illuminate our hearts and minds to the truth behind this amazing parable that Jesus gave on that day? I pray that you would teach us that we would be transformed and changed, that our hearts would be encouraged, that we would not be losing heart, and that we would do what we're doing now. We would always pray when we're losing heart. And so I thank you that, you that that's what you want for us more than anything else, is that we would not lose heart, but go, but go. And so, Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for this word, and I pray your blessings in Jesus' worthy name. Amen got a sermon title for you today. It's a little different, kind of a turn on things, which is a lot of what Jesus is doing. The sermon title is The Outs and the Ins of the Kingdom. The Outs and the Ins of the Kingdom. So let's look at verse 9. I'll put it up for you. 
where Luke records these words, he also, Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So first off, uh, what I want to do for you is let me draw a couple of similarities between this parable and the previous one that I hope you will see, and and maybe I'm sure you might have. First, both parables begin with Luke basically from the start telling us the big idea of the parable. Same last week, same this week. That's very unusual for parables of Jesus. You will know the pattern that we've been through already, and you'll see it again as we visit a few more in the days and weeks ahead, that Jesus usually tells the parable and it unfolds, and then boom, there's the big idea. It shows up later in the parable. Well, with these, they start off this way, Luke giving us the big idea, and then what we see unpacking in these are the lessons that we're to learn from it. So that's the first. The second is that this parable is also, again, about contrasts, right? Contrasting characters, contrasting uh, principles, and maybe even a few contrasting lessons. And so my hope today is that the insights that we will learn today, that they will be a real encouragement to you and an impact on your walk with Jesus in these days, in these days, but also, also that they will impact your love for your neighbor as yourself, whether your neighbor are those who are oppressed or oppressors. Wait, what? D- did you hear me right? Yes, yes, you did. So the big idea then is right here, and it is this. The big idea is this. There are some people in our world today, in that day, who trust in themselves for their Keyword righteousness. There are people in that day, since that day, to this day, and always will be people who, based on what they do, how they act, how they behave, how they are different from others, is their basis for their righteousness or appearing to be morally above others. And that's the big idea. And so this parable then is about this contrast, besides the characters. It's the the contrast between the wrong way that some people go about achieving what they think is righteousness or what they think makes them righteous and the right and only way to receive righteousness, righteousness that none of us have, into the kingdom of God, the only way into the kingdom of God that Jesus will show us today. So there's something we think, I think we need to learn today also about questions And I want to tell you a quick little story. I heard a great story actually last week about Ravi Zacharias, uh, the Christian apologist, evangelist, and preacher who sadly passed away uh, a little over a week ago. Uh, One of the things that he was best known for, and I think frankly loved for, was how he handled anyone who asked him questions. Whether they were an atheist, a skeptic, it didn't matter. From another religion, he, he just had this disarming way, respectful, always thoughtful way of answering questions, and often his answers were really quite profound. Well, during this interview that I saw him part of last week, he was asked where he got, like, where did this non-confrontational, disarming style come from? Like, was it from your mom or whatever, right? And he was really quick to answer. Ravi was really quick. He basically responded, first of all, by saying the Lord showed him two very profound ideas early in his ministry, and they'd stuck with him from that day forward. First, he just observed Jesus. He he observed Jesus being asked questions, and then Jesus had a pattern. He would be asked a question, then Jesus would ask the questioner a question, answering a a question with a question. Apparently, it's a bad thing, not not according to Jesus, right? You'll remember at one point, uh, someone comes up to him, I believe it is also a, a ruler or a Pharisee, comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher, how does someone, how do I inherit eternal life? Do you remember what Jesus said? Well, he didn't say, well, you do this. He didn't say that. He asked this question. Why do you call me good? It, it was just brilliant. And so Ravi noticed that, and Jesus does that all the time, and quite frankly, for good reason. The other thing that Ravi noticed was that there were a very high percentage of times when Jesus, in his teachings, and his parables in particular, where what he was doing was answering questions that hadn't necessarily been asked publicly, but he knew there was a question. He knew there was a question. We've already read that a couple times in the Gospel of Luke. He knew their hearts. He knew what they were thinking, and so he knew that in their hearts they were having questioning spirits, and so he would answer their questions in his teachings. Secondly, 
Ravi also noted this uh, very important insight. One day at a very large conference in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, I believe, uh, he was uh, uh, answering questions. At the end of every one of his talks, he would always answer questions, and that was really, for most people, the, the highlight of his talks, is, and again, which highlights how he would answer. But a couple stood up, a young couple in their early 30s, I believe, stood up and asked him one of the most frequently asked questions of any apologist, any pastor for that matter, uh, any Christian by a skeptic or by an atheist is this question. Why does a good and loving God allow so much pain and suffering in the world? I mean, that's a standard. It's a good question, right? Ravi was about to, he said in this interview, he was about to give his questioning the questioner type of response, philosophical response that he would normally go to, but the Lord made him pause. And he all of a sudden looked and he saw behind the couple in a chair right behind them a small infant who was severely, severely deformed. And it was there that he learned an important lesson. And he said this lesson changed his heart towards any questioner from that point on. And I'm going to quote him. He said at this point, behind every questioner is a question. And in this case, their question is not just a philosophical one, it's a felt need. So, both in terms of the existential reality and in in terms of the assumptions, great Ravi language, it's important, he said, to question the questioner. Why? To get to the heart. To get to the heart. So now with Ravi, but more importantly with Jesus, I want to make sure that we see this in today's parable. Jesus is answering a very important question. It's potentially the most important question of all time, and and both the Pharisee and the tax collector are asking this question, not necessarily in the text, but it's, it's there, it's underlying there, and it is a felt need that each of these men have. Yes, it's a felt need even of a Pharisee. And the question is based on one of these two ideas. It's either this, how am I saved? How is someone made righteous? And, or how do I become righteous? What do I have to do to become righteous, to be approved and be accepted by others or by God? What do I have to do? And so that's a question that Jesus, I would suggest, is pretty much the expert on, don't you think? And, and, and that's, so that is underlying behind what's going on here today, I suggest to you. He loves both, this is the other thing that I want you to see in this, he loves both of these people, both of these questioners. That's why he's taking his time to deal with them both. And so I think we need to be careful of how we approach that. So it is in this wonderful parable that we will learn that there is, yes, a wrong way, a way that will not lead to ultimate salvation and eternal life with God, and a right way, frankly, the only way to salvation. Let's let Jesus teach us the parable. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Big contrast. (laughs) Judge, persistent widow. Huge contrast that we're seeing right here. So listen, at the first what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in on a huge limb here. Uh, Maybe not so much. And I'm going to suggest that as soon as we read who the two main characters are in this parable, right, uh, that you immediately have a picture in your mind, you have a picture in your mind of the identities, the characteristics, and positions of the two men. And I'm going to suggest this as well, that maybe, just maybe, you might be a little bit like me, you might have a favorite, or you might have one that you would more identify with. And I've got to believe it's not the Pharisee. Let's be careful about that. Let's be careful. We all know, of course, that the Pharisees are the bad guys, right? They're always depicted that way and made out to be the bad guys. They're the hypocrites. Jesus himself described them as the oppressors of the Jewish people. You're putting burdens on my people. You're oppressing them with all your additional laws. And you hypocrites, he called them, right? I mean, he did that often. Back at the beginning of chapter 12, when he turns to his disciples to really start getting them ready for the cross and the mission that's going to come, what does he start off with? Right there at the beginning of chapter 12, he starts off with, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But listen, he didn't say, don't like the Pharisees. His point was, don't like what they do. Don't become like what they do. He didn't say, 
don't like them. He just wanted to make sure the disciples understood that their behavior, their hypocrisy is based on behavior, a way of doing things, and, and that idea can spread and it can just ruin the ministry and ruin the gospel. So don't be like them, but not don't like them. There's a big difference. He goes on in verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Hmm. So let's picture the scene here. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, right? The Pharisees are lingering around. They're always there. That's why Jesus is talking to them, because they're there, right? And, and he's telling a story about two contrasting characters, and the first character up is the Pharisees, so you know he's got their attention, right? And, 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 and you also know that before we even begin here, they're looking at the scenario going, well, <laughs> we're going to come out looking pretty good here. We're hung. The first interesting detail is where this man is standing. Do you see that? Look at the text, where this man is standing. He's by himself. That's an important distinction. And I, I look at that and I ask myself, why? okay, Luke's recording it, but these were the words that Jesus said and others told him. This is what he said. Why do you think Jesus would put forward that little detail that he's standing? Why didn't you just say he's there? No, he's standing by himself. Well, for one reason, I think, because one word comes to mind. It's the word separation, right? He, he's separating himself from the other man for sure, and also, I'm going to suggest to you, everyone else it would appear because he's by himself. He's not over with his brothers, with the other dudes, the other Pharisees. No, he's by himself. And so with this kind of man, you and I know what that looks like, right? We know the pattern. We know what they look like. Based on their outward actions, their words, their deeds, they are walking around all the time presenting themselves as what? Better. Above. Elevated. In the church and in the culture. So let's think about that for a moment before we move on. Being careful not to think that this kind of attitude is exclusive to religious Pharisees, Jewish Pharisees in that day. It can also be, and it is, a metaphor for two different types of people that have been part of culture and part of the world forever. That's what I think Jesus wants to show us. I think we do that in our day today as well. I think it's very easy to see. We see injustice and oppression in our world all the time, and it's the result of one group of people who think they're right, they've got it right, and what do they do? They hold other people in contempt. They oppress them. It's another way of looking at the word contempt. You look down at them. You're above and beyond. They believe that they're better, whether because of the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their religion, their political party. Oh, yes, right? And, or you name it. So now listen, friends. Let's be careful. Let's be really careful. It does not take long for the pendulum to swing, does it? I've been around longer than some of you. And I've seen that happen. I've, I've seen it be clear that there is one group that's oppressed by these oppressors, and, and it, just over time, it, it, I've seen it happen. The pendulum swings. Those who get so angered the most as a result of the blatant racism that's out there can soon to begin to classify all white policemen, right, as suspect and capable of doing exactly the same thing. It's happening right now, isn't it? It's happening today. We can do that in the church too, right? We can do that in the church. Amen? Hello? <laughs> yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. There are theological positions, right? There's the Reformed camp. There's the Charismatic camp. You know, the Charismatic camp. Woo! Praise Jesus. Hands in the air when you sing, right? And then there's the more serious group with their Bibles open and their notebooks open and then hands are like taped to your side, right? And, and there's, so there's that for sure. There's the translations differences, right? There's the King James, the, if that was good enough, the Apostle Paul, it should be good enough for us. Okay, hang on a second, um, right? I mean, translations of the Bible, uh, musical instruments or a cappella, which of course leads us to the, yes, the regulative principle and things like that. 
See, what happens is, is that certain groups of people, whether denominations or practices, what we do, we end up getting to a position where we believe, God, you must love us more. You must be blessing us more. You will bless us more because, look, we're doing things more rightly than they are. I've seen it a lot, and when we planted this church 10 years ago, Lord willing, we've been trying to expunge those kind of things uh, from day one, but it never fails that sometimes we don't do enough for some people, right, or too much for others. Uh, That's just the way it is. So that then is what everyone does, I want to suggest to you, who compares themselves with others and deems themselves to be better. We separate. We elevate ourselves, and trust me, it can be exhausting. Okay, it's my confession for you. I I do hope and believe and trust that God is doing and will continue to do a work in my heart on those levels. Next, we see something remarkable and awesome. This Pharisee prays, right? That's interesting, don't you think, that after last week's passage, which was about prayer, he's going to be, there's going to be about two men praying. So that's an interesting link. I don't think that's an accident. So Jesus reveals for all who have ears to hear the wrong way to pray through this Pharisee and then the right way as well as we'll see. And so first there's the wrong way, but let's make sure we see this. He starts off well, right? His prayer starts off, the first four words are awesome. Lord, I thank you. (laughs) Our Father, hallowed be your name. The prayer, he's, he's on the right track, right? Although very briefly, thanking God, but it turns very quickly into something else, doesn't? A different kind of prayer. He thanks God for, look at this, people whom he is not like. this 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 is going in a different direction. He thanks God for the kind of person that he is, at least in his mind. So I want you to imagine this for just a second, that you are God receiving this prayer, right? I know that's a stretch for all of us. You're hearing this prayer. Now, do you really think that if you were hearing this prayer, you would think that this person is thanking you, really, right? Have you ever written a thank you card or letter to anybody because of something wonderful and they gave you a gift or, or they, they just have been wonderful to you? It, has, the, has your letter sounded anything like this? Right? No, no, you're, you're lifting them up. You're thanking them for their generosity and for their love for you and, and what they mean to you, and, right? Maybe? So to start then, he lists the other types of people he is not like. He's not the kind of person, look, look at this, who extorts people, which is exactly what the fair, the, he's pointing to, of course, the tax collector, who he'll mention at the end as well, over there, because that's exactly what they did. They were extortionists. Their job was to collect taxes for the evil Romans of their own people, the Jewish people, and the way they made their profit was to add a markup. As big as they could, they would extort you. They would, right? And so he says, I'm just really glad I'm like those kind of people. And so, of course, he's comparing himself with the tax collector who was doing exactly that. He says, I don't do things like that. In the same way, he's not unjust. He's claiming not to be unjust, nor is he unfaithful in his marriage. So he's, he's never committed adultery. And he's certainly not like this tax collector. That's what he winds up with again. So that's what he's not. And, and do you know what? Do you know what? Let me ask you this. What do you think he thinks God will do with this part of his prayer? What question is he trying to get answered is another question. I think, to start anyway, and we'll see the second part of that get answered, I hope, in a bit, I think he's looking for applause, isn't he? Good for you, right? Would seem like that. Second, he then lists a few of his very great accomplishments. He fasts twice a week, and he tithes of his increase. So he generously gives to the Lord's earthly ministry to the temple, uh, to support the, the priesthood and, and all those things. He's, he, here's what I find so interesting around all those, these things, though. All of, his, all of his do-nots, the things that he does not do, are biblical. Uh, I mean, the last time I checked, they are, they're all sins that he's not doing, so he says, right? So that's, that's kind of remarkable. Uh, then on the do side, yes, he tithes, which is, again, a teaching of the Bible that we should give of our fir- first fruits, but he's thrown in one of his own here. He says, I fast twice a week. That's not in the Bible. 
fasting is encouraged. Uh, it's, it's not commanded per se in, in this way. Certainly not twice a week. So what's he doing? Well, again, this, this guy's been at this for a while, so what he's doing is he's padding his CV, right? He's like, come on. Like, I, I'm, I'm, that's why he's standing by himself, right? He's like a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's better than even the rest of his buddies. So, listen, at this point, I have a big question for all of us here today, and it flows on from last week's passage just before this. Remember, the idea was if you're beginning to lose heart, in last week's parable, especially when it comes to all the great injustices and oppression in this world today, what are we to do? Well, as I said, and maybe to some of your dismay, we're not told that we are to protest, to picket, to get angry, to take sides, which leads to all kinds of equally wrong reactions, but we are encouraged to first always pray. Always pray. The moment it comes to your mind, wells up in your heart, pray. That was the big idea from last week's parable. Now here at this point, what is this man not thankful for but should be if, big if, his actions are actually evidence of his righteousness, which is what he's trying to impress God with, I believe. Well, I'll suggest this to you. This, do, this man doesn't pray the fruits of the Spirit, does he? He doesn't pray, Lord, I just want to thank you for the work you're doing in my heart. I want to thank you for making me more loving. Um, thank you for helping me to be more, more joyful in my giving, my generosity. Thank you for giving me peace in, this, in these days of COVID and, and all the other things that I'm seeing in this world today. Thank you for that. Thank you for making me gentle and kind and giving me self-control. Thank you so much for those things. Galatians 5, 22 to 24, by the way. You see, this man's desire for righteousness was all based on outward performance, which is the wrong way. I, I think you know that. There's no inward change in this man. There there's been no change inside of him which is why he prays and thinks of himself and therefore acts and behaves the way that he does. So may I encourage all of you here today to be careful that we not let injustice or anything else for that matter cause us to lose heart. And rather than that, pray first. Pray first. And then listen, yes, go to those who are oppressed as their advocate Love them, care for them, provide for them, advocate for them, speak out against oppression, of course. But may I also encourage all of you that before you take any action, respond in any way. Consider Galatians 5, to 24. Let me just read the words to you. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. The fruit of inward transformation and change in your heart, in my mind, and mine is this. Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So may we pray, Lord, may, I, may what I am about to say or do be loving in these ways, even to my enemy. So what do we do then with all this? What do we do then with all this so far? What do we do? Well, to understand the lesson that Jesus wants all of us to learn from this, uh, I think we need to see this. At no point does Jesus suggest he's making these things up. This man, this Pharisee is making these things up that he is not in fact doing and, and, and doing, not doing and doing all the things that he's listed. In other words, listen, please hear this. In the minds of the culture, in the minds of the world, and in the minds of God, quite frankly, he's a good man. If these things are all true, he's a good man. Certainly in religious faith, of the Judaism of that day, he certainly is. So what you should actually you and I learn then from this? Well, to begin with, I want, you to, I want to take you back to what Ravi was saying about questioning the questioner and the question behind the questioner. 
Why was this man praying this way? Now, I know it's a parable, but Jesus is trying to make a point and teach us something here. Why was he praying this way? What's his motivation? Because, listen, as I've already said, Jesus is answering a question, and that question is, how am I made righteous? How am I saved? How do I in inherit eternal life? That's, that's why this man is going to all this work to do these things, is because he wants that question answered. He wants it answered. And if that is the question, then what is behind this man and his questions? What is behind his motivations to live the way that he does and that has brought him to the point of believing that he's on the right path, that all that he is doing is the right way? This is a crucial point, I believe, for all of us who in our tumultuous days are feeling faint. <laughs> Come on are losing heart over injustice and oppression in the world today. How does, how should the Christian and the church deal with this, with oppression, with the oppressed and the oppressors? Well, I believe this is true. You will not find a teaching by Jesus or any of the apostles that we are to love the oppressed and hate the oppressor. Correct me if I'm wrong. Text me. If, if, if I've got that wrong, please let me know. That's not what I see, but that's what we do. We do it. We do it. It's what wells up in our hearts if the fruit of the Spirit is not present. No, we are taught by Jesus to do the hardest things, the hardest thing of all. <laughs> we are to love our enemies. And so what Ravi discovered is what we need to see, and it is this. We need to ask this question. What is behind the question that causes this man to think and act the way that he does. What is motivating him? Well, it's the same thing that motivates you. It's the same thing that motivates me. It's the same thing that motivates everyone. It's called acceptance and approval. It's our universal felt need. It's what it is. He needs the acceptance and approval of everyone in his culture, everyone in his church, everyone in the temple, everyone in the marketplace. He needs that. That's why he's working so hard to look that good. But he also, of course, needs and knows that he wants to and needs to earn God's acceptance and approval. He knows that. He knows that. No, I know some of you must be thinking, <laughs> the Pharisees have felt needs? Well, I hope you can see that so far from what we've seen. You want me to show them kindness and mercy? They're the oppressors of the people of Israel. Glenn, you've already said that. Pastor, you've shown us that with all their rules and regulations and their hypocrisy. Jesus would say, yes. That's why he's preaching this to them. He's not trying to condemn them. He's trying to soften their hearts so that they would change inwardly and turn to the right way. So Jesus tells us why this is going on. <laughs> By pointing us to the other man, to the right way, to, to, find, to find true righteousness, which is absolutely necessary if we ever want to be found in the presence of a holy, perfect, and righteous God. He says in verse 13, but the tax collector, look at this, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You're God hearing that prayer. So this is a very powerful contrast that I honestly believe is lost on most of, most of us today. I think it's lost on us, and I'll tell you why. As I alluded to earlier, our tendency would be to identify with this guy more than the, the Pharisee, right? I mean, wouldn't you really? I mean, you want to because obviously he's the good guy in this story for sure. He's got it right, but let me just remind us all of this fact. In that day, everyone... Pharisee, religious Jew, every single pleb in society that day hated tax collectors. They were equally oppressors. They were not liked at all. I mean, a, a, com, a, a, a more modern example would be like Nazi sympathizers. These guys were traitors to their own people. And now Jesus is, this is the guy? This is the guy? Well, look. This man also came to the temple to pray, though, didn't he? That's the point Jesus is making. This is a comparison, but it's also about principle. And so notice the words. 
the words that we see here is this man is far off. That is radically different than standing by oneself, isn't it? One is choosing, choosing to separate himself as a result of pride and arrogance. The other knows he is separated by others, but he also knows this, please see this, that he is separated from God. And why and how do we know that? Because look at his confession. I'm a sinner. He's got nothing to commend himself before God. I, I can't prove to you that I've been a good Jew. I can't prove to you that I've been a good husband. I can't prove to you anything, Lord. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And so that's his plea. I mean, he, he, his feelings, his position, he's so low he can't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He's beating his chest and he's repeating his mea culpa. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus concludes. I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This statement, this conclusion of this parable in that day, in that place, to those people from the mouth of Jesus was utterly shocking. You and I, I, like, thankfully, I think you and I today, this side of the cross, but, but also <laughs> our feelings about injustice and oppression, we're like, no, this is good. This man humbled himself. We get that. This is good. But again, we, we, we miss the days that this is being said. And you've got to hear it this way. As the words of the voice of authority, this is what they would have heard. The words of the voice of authority that they would have heard were the words of a judge. And so remember last week's parable? About a judge, right? A wicked, unrighteous judge? Yeah, uh huh. The, the Holy Spirit linking these things together orderly. It's amazing. It's beautiful. So, Jesus, as the judge, let's see this, of the world, slams down his gavel at this point and says to this sinner, It is my judgment. I declare you just. But not this man. You just, not this man. That's what he said to all of them in that day. That was outrageous. So this word just is the same word as the word righteous. I declare you righteous, Jesus says, but not you, not you. So that's the great lesson, and this is the gospel, the good news, and it's the really, really, really great lesson from this parable. There's nothing that you and I can do, you know this, to gain the acceptance and approval of our God. It is fully dependent on what Jesus has done for you and God declaring you justified, righteous, because of Jesus. And the good news gets even better. The good news is that now that we are justified in Christ, we are, He has paid for the, the price, for the penalty of our sin. We, yes, we still sin in this life today, but we cannot, in Christ, at any point, lose that acceptance and approval and love that God has for us. We feel that way sometimes, but we cannot. We cannot lose His grace, His approval, and His acceptance ever. That should change the way that we live today. So listen, all that this sinner did in this parable was respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. At some point in his life, in the way that he was living as a tax collector in that world, in that culture, he, he, he came humbly to the temple on that day. He wasn't welcome there, by the way, but he came humbly that day, stood afar off because he probably was afraid they were going to throw him out. Stood far off, and he begged, he repented. Dear Lord God, forgive me. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what He wants to do for you today. He's doing that all the time. If you will just turn and repent, today you too can be saved. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Watch Him do the transforming work in your heart and give you the fruits of the Spirit. Oh, Lord, give us the fruits of the Spirit. Christian, let me say this in closing. Knowing what Jesus has done for you how He has forgiven you 
declared you justified based on no effort, nothing that you've done, quite the contrary. Will you now do this? Will we now do this together, church? Will we always pray and then go, yes, and care for the poor, the afflicted, and the oppressed, and also love our enemies? That's what's needed today. That's what's needed today. I pray today that we will all do this from this day forward. Pray with me, would you? Oh, Father. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what's going on in the world today. You see God and you care. We know that's true. So, Heavenly Father, we praise your name. I lift up your name, Lord. I acknowledge you are the one who can change hearts. You are the all-powerful God. You're, you're the one, Lord Jesus, who can wrestle a Pharisee, a murderer of Christians to the ground and turn him into the Apostle Paul. Lord, we know you can do these things. We know that you are doing these things. So, Lord, would you, again, answer our prayer from last week. Help us not to lose heart. Help us, Lord, in these days where we're seeing people being murdered, literally murdered. Would you help us? Help us not to lose heart. Help us not, not to get angry. Not to lash out. Not to return violence with violence. So, Lord, we're praying. We're asking you. At the same time, Lord, I pray right here in Squamish, right on our own backyard, right, right here, Lord, show us those who are oppressed. Show us those who we can go and walk with, who we can advocate with. Show us better ways, Lord, how we can speak out, speak the gospel of the kingdom into this world of oppression, oppression and oppressors. And at all times, Lord, do that in a loving way. Just as you continue to do for these Pharisees in that day. Oh, Lord, help us. I don't know how to do that in my own strength, Lord. I don't think any of us do. So would you help us? I thank you so much for what you're going to do. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my Lord Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should puff Though trial shall come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, know the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. 
It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sung. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The drum shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you very much for worshiping with us this morning. It was great to have you tune in. Please make sure to tune in again this coming week for midweek worship. And uh, yeah, we pray a blessing over you in Jesus' name and for you to join us again uh, next Sunday morning as well. Have a great rest of your day and week. Bye-bye.